But to get you the best value for your home, it's always best for me to come in and see your home in person, or at least talk to you on the phone. So question number two is, how can I prepare my home for sale? So that's a good question. So if your home doesn't sell within the time frame that you had or we had agreed that it should sell on it. Of factors, I mean, I never thought about backup offers before I started working in this industry. And it's just such a logical thing to do. So welcome again today with PDX RE team, Kim and Mariah. And uh, we are here to answer some more questions. This time it's going to be about sellers. One of the most common asked questions by sellers. You know, again, these answers could be expanded quite a bit more. So if you do have any questions on any of them, please feel free to post a question below. Hit like and subscribe and we'd love to hear from you. So let's start out with the uh, first most common questions. All right, the first one is, what's my home worth? Sellers often want to know the estimated market value of their home based on recent sales, comparable properties, and the current market conditions. Okay, that's, that's a very good question, and I get that a lot of times. A lot of times people want that answer over the phone. If you want something over the phone, more than likely you're just going to go to someplace like Zillow or Redfin or even Remax.com, and they're going to just take a quick snapshot of recently sold properties according to what the tax records say your home is. But to get you the best value for your home, it's always best for me to come in and see your home in person, or at least talk to you on the phone, look at what kind of upgrades that you've had done in the past, uh, what kind of neighborhood that you live in, because sometimes, believe it or not, the neighbor across the street can affect the price of your home. So it's always important to get a more accurate assessed value of your home by visiting it in person. But the first thing we do is we take the comps. So comparables are given 10% and square footage to either side. So if you've got a 1600 square foot home, we might go from 1400 to 18, 1850. We also look at the age of the home. We want similar in age, give or take 10 to 15 years. Newer homes, of course, you want to come uh, pretty much compare just to newer homes, or at least within two or three years. But older homes, we try to give a little bit of a range there. And the style of the home, is it a ranch style, single level, is it two level, is it three level, is it split level? All of those factors are going to make a big difference in the price or the value of your home. Again, it's always best to come and visit it to know that in person. Then I'll take and compare that to similar properties within a one mile radius. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you have to go further. One mile radius, what has sold in the last two to three months that are similar to yours I'll compare yours. You're going to get everything that's sold out there. So you may have eight properties. Two may be ones that haven't been updated. Two may be updated 10 years ago. Two may be updated more recently. And that's why it's best to get the accurate value if I can come and see your house. I compare them to those and give you a range. Now, if I can't come and see your house, I will just give you a range. I would prefer, much prefer, and for you to get the most accurate value of your home is to have that eight and come out and look at your home and talk to you about it because a lot of that can vary. And then time uh, on market, you know, you want to compare yours to other uh, houses in the area that have time on market. They've been on the market for a long time. They started out overpriced. Let me back up a little bit too. We're going to compare them to sold homes. You can't necessarily compare them to just active homes because actives haven't sold yet. We're still seeing uh, today, uh, this is June, 2024, almost 40% of homes that are listed on the market have had a price reduction in the last 28 days, at least, if not more. So you want to make sure that the days on market, depending on your time frame to sell, are going to match your needs. And then we can come up with more accurate value and we produce the CMA, I deliver it to you and we go over it and complete. So it's a really hard um, answer to give you just by talking to you on the phone and what your home value is again. You're going to just call me up and ask me what's my home worth today. If I haven't been in it, of course, my clients, I know their homes. If I haven't been in it, it's going to be probably just as accurate as Zillow or Redfin or Remax.com or any other site that's just doing a millisecond search on the internet and saying, here's the value of your home. So, uh, again, it's always best to have the realtor inside the home. Yep, a lot that goes into it, it sounds like. There is. <laughs> So question number two is, how can I prepare my home for sale? Sellers seek advice on preparing their home for listing, including staging, decluttering, <laughs> making repairs, and enhancing curb appeal. So this is the part um, that, again, it's best for me to come in and see the house for 
uh, me to be able to answer that the best for you. Uh, it depends on, you know, if you're in a rush to get out of it and there's no work that you want to do to it, or can I talk you into doing, you know, $400 worth of work, a couple thousand dollars worth of work, or is it going to need a whole remodel? That all depends on the house uh, specifically. But let's go towards some of the basics. The first thing to do is you want to declutter. I'm not going to be your best friend uh, when I come in there and tell you what to do to get your home for sale because I'm going to tell you what buyers are looking for. So as a buyer's and seller's agent, I'm out there with buyers and I know what they're looking for. So I'm going to give you an answer based on what buyers are most attracted to. And a lot of that from the start is going to be declutter and depersonalize. They so definitely want to start getting rid of all the personal items, personal pictures, the collectibles. You know, you have a lot of people who collect CDs, cars, spoons, thimbles, shot glasses. You want to not distract the potential buyer from looking at your collectibles and try to see or read about you. Every minute they spend on looking at your, you know, I know it's precious to you, but you want to get rid of those because you don't want them staring at that. And judging you, you want them looking at the home. Decluttering too, you want to give it a spacious feel. You want to try to make it look as magazine ready as possible. Now that's not going to be true with everything, but again, as magazine ready as possible. If you live with, you know, um, five kids and four dogs and you have this gigantic uh, U-shaped couch that's just taking up the whole living room, we're going to ask you to remove some of those items too. It may not be comfortable, but again, you're trying to sell your house. This is what we want to do. Same with bedrooms. Same with uh, bathrooms, that type of thing. Everything off the counters, kitchens, you know, the biggest things that uh, help a person decide if they want the house or not is going to be the primary bedroom, um, the uh, kitchen, and then, of course, the living space and backyard. But uh, first, declutter and depersonalize. Another thing you want to do is have it deep cleaned, okay? I know that everybody's idea of clean is different. I, I, my idea of clean is probably different from Mariah's idea of clean, which is probably different from your idea of a generic plane, you know, again, deep plane. We want to get, people are going to be looking at your house and saying, you've treated your house this way. Now you may have not cleaned it for years or months and that's fine. But if we can make it appear that you've always kept it that clean by doing that deep cleaning, we're talking in the window runners, cleaning out all the dead bugs and things like that in there, cleaning out around the toilet seat around the sinks, recalking around the sinks really makes a big difference. Uh, touching up that grout that's all over the place uh, that hasn't been done. Cleaning mirrors, cleaning windows inside and out, cleaning screens. A lot of us leave our windows open and screens collect a lot of dust. We want to clean those. We want to clean the vents, intake vents for your HVAC system. You don't want to leave them all dusty and dirty. Uh, cobwebs that are up on the high ceiling or even the... Uh, ones that are around lights. Now you're out at exterior lights. Guess what? They attract bugs. Guess what bugs attract? Spiders. So now all of a sudden you have all these cobwebs and bugs around the exterior lights. You want to clean those off too. Your front door, uh, that type of thing. That's going to be the first thing that people see. So you want to make that as clean as possible. The minor repairs and the maintenance that needs to be done on your house. You kind of know what you've been putting off. Now, not everybody is going to see the scratch on the wall that's been bugging you for years, you know. You know where it's at, but most people won't see it. I'm talking about um, doing the the repairs that are necessary. If somebody came in and turned on a faucet and continues to leak, let's get that fixed. Same thing with the shower head. Same thing, like I said before, with caulking uh, around toilets and around tubs and around sinks. You want to do those minor repairs and maintenance. And please, by all means, I'm begging you, make sure all your lights match. Now, here in the Pacific Northwest, I am going to say, Everybody should change their lights out when they're going to sell the daylight type lights. That's the, not the bright white. They're called daylight. Being that we're cloudy most of the time, being that most homes have trees around them, being that most homes may be tight in and not have the best, we put a patio cover over the back door so we're restricting light from coming in. Change those all out to daylight lights. But having a combination of different lights in the bathroom or in your uh, dining room chandelier just isn't appealing. And daylight lights, of course, just make the whole thing look a lot brighter. Believe it or not, it's even going to change the color of your walls once you finally change them. If everybody's using those yellow incandescents. Change it out. Change one to a daylight and let me know what you think because I think 
you're going to say, oh, it's a lot brighter in here than I thought. You want to enhance your curb appeal. Okay, I tell everybody, you've got 60 seconds to sell your home. The first 30 seconds is what are they first seeing when they drive up to the house? Curb appeal is very important. Lawn mode, about a month or two before you decide to go on the market, you want to take in um, weed and feed or whatever kind of fertilizer that you want for your lawn. You want to keep it trimmed. You want to uh, uh, cut down, trim around the edges, clean those bushes, clear all bushes that are up above the bottom of any windows, everything below the top of the wind or the bottom of the window. Open up that whole view for people to see your house from the street. Again, that's going to set them into the right mood as they go through the rest of your house. Front door, is it still dusty or dirty? Does it need a new paint job? Something minor that you can do. Those cobwebs, I told you about the lights. That's your first 30 seconds. Your second 30 seconds is what do they first see, smell, and hear when they get into a house? Yes, see. Are they seeing the clutter? Are they seeing something pleasant and put them in that right mood? Are they smelling pets? Are they smelling some kind of um, food item that you just cooked the night before um, or whatever? We all, we're used to our own smells, so we don't normally smell it. Have a neighbor, have a friend come over and say, do me a favor, does my house smell? One thing don't do, don't cover it up with all those little um, plugins, please. Uh, whenever that's overwhelming, especially if you have to, you're going to do it on the light um, um setting on it instead of the high setting because you don't want to overwhelm people saying, well, what are they covering up? But hopefully you're not doing that. And if you do do it, apple spice, apple cinnamon is the best one. Vanillas and some other things get to people. Apple cinnamon tends to be the most neutral one if you have to do that. Staging. I would hope that if I can't help you out in telling you what to declutter, I can get a stager over there to tell you what to do. And if it's an empty house, we definitely want a staging. Staging makes a big difference. People cannot come in and see their house like how they might want to live. They just see this big empty room that might be hard for them to picture will such and such fit in here. Yeah. So I believe highly on staging. Uh, even if it's using your own furniture, it's making it look the most pleasing. So I may bring a, bring a straight stager, blah, bring a stager out there to tell you exactly what it is that you need to do uh, to make it look the most appealing. So staging is an option there. Neutral decor, too. We want to take off, you know, even in the kids' rooms, you know, the Led Zeppelin posters or whoever else is, you know, more uh, famous. I know kids don't have a Led Zeppelin. That's probably in the adults' room. Yeah. But whatever kids are putting up there, um, uh, not taking anything away from religion at all, but you don't want it to be over -really, overly religious in there. Not a lot of crosses or a lot of um, whatever it is that you may um, um, you have as, an, as a religion. Uh, icon there. We want to kind of neutralize that a little bit. Uh, and again, that bright painted red wall or pink wall or something like that in the dining room, that accent wall that looks so great with your stuff, may want to paint over that. Again, we want to neutralize as much of the home as possible. May need a whole paint job, uh, believe it or not, but I'll let you know that. And the last thing is professional photos. We definitely want professional photos. So I hire a professional photographer. We also hire a videographer who comes in and does a walkthrough tour of your home and of the neighborhood too. But you need professionals. Me coming in with my uh, iPhone is not going to cut it. I've seen so many of those. I want a professional photographer out there to come in and take those photos and that way people will see them. And yes, they still may, may be a little surprised when they finally get in there, but at least they're not avoiding it because of the lack of good photos. A lot of people do rule things out from photos. So. Um, I definitely, as I walk through the home, give you a CMA. I give you a checklist of things to do just to make your home more appealing to the most clients. I think, too, um, while you're talking about decluttering, depersonalizing, it's not saying to get rid of those items unless you absolutely want to. Um, it's just pack them away. You're planning on moving anyways by selling the house, so it kind of gets you a jump start on that packing anyways, which we all don't, well, not all of us enjoy. Um, and then also, um, what was the last bit? Oh, the daylight lights. Definitely notice that now every time I walk into a house, if I see <laughs> the lights, I'm like, oh, they have mismatching lights. So they're like, oh, that's not one of my biggest pet peeves. You might start noticing that. Um, thank you, or we're sorry, not sure which. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, right. All right. All right. So, question number three What marketing strategies will you use to sell my home? Sellers inquire about the realtor's marketing plan including online listings, professional photography, virtual tours, open houses, and targeted advertising. 
So that's a good question because a lot of times people will come in and tell you it's going to be on every site out there. And that's for the most part true because once the house gets listed in the MLS, it's going to be pulled that IDX, all the red pins, all the Remax, all the other companies are going to pull that information, put them on their own site uh, for you to read through Zillow, all those places. So I can tell you it's going to be on every website out there. And so again, for the most part, that's true as soon as it goes on the MLS. We want to do a little bit more than that. So what we do here at REMAX uh, Equity Group, PDX RE team, real estate team, is we do professional photos, like I said before, but we also do a video. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take that video and also point it to a personalized website. So if you have, if you live at 1234, you know, Banana Avenue, that's going to be the website, 1234bananaavenue.com going to have a little QR code out front so people can just take and snap on that, go in and see all the professional photos of your home and, the, or excuse me, the video tour. We don't have to do the photo tour, do the video tour of your home and the neighborhood. We like to highlight the neighborhood. So like I said, professional photos, the video tour, personal website, social media advertising too. So depending on the house, if it's in a really hot market, you may not have to go this far, but I tend to put things on Facebook too and gear those towards anybody who's looking for a home in a certain area, area or radius. Now, does that work? You know, I the last house that we have, I think there was 7,193 clicks through it or something like that, not clicks through it, views on Facebook, but there's only three clicks. So it depends on whether people are going to click on it or not, but at least it's getting out there to people who have done some kind of a search for looking for a home or have been on one of the big search engine sites looking for a home, Facebook and their, all their analytics, they know that. And so they'll pull that up. Um, the online listings, of course, like I said, is going to be on every site out there that's pulling information from uh, MLSs. So it's going to be on every single one of those. Email marketing, we tend to do email marketing to uh, number one, all our clients. And number two, we may do postcard marketing to all the neighbors. Uh, especially when it comes to doing an open house, we have special invites for the first open house for all the neighbors over there, uh, virtual tours. So not, not only are you going to get the video tour that's going through it, but our photographer also does a virtual tour with the photos. So there's going to be two links in the MLS that'll have both those tours. First link is always going to be the video tour. Second link is also always going to be the virtual tour. One thing I don't do is I don't do those Matterports, not cutting them down at all. But personally, for me, if I go onto a site and look at the Matterport view, it makes me dizzy having to walk from circle to circle and having the thing spin around. I'd rather see somebody walking through it. Uh, now, again, you may enjoy that. That's just not something that, that I'm going to do uh, on there. And then print marketing, like I said, we'll do postcards. We're going to do personal invites to the neighborhood. We're going to do advertisements through uh, all social media platforms that we have for open houses for new listings. Uh, and then we, of course, have the Find the Frog. So, you know, if you find the frog in any of our new listings, the newest listing, you have a chance to win a $20 Amazon or coffee card. But uh, we make it make it fun a little bit just to get more people interested in clicking through it. The higher rate that people click on something, again, the analytics of all these uh, search engines, they see, you know, that it's been getting 175 views on YouTube or the Instagram page or whatever it is, and then they'll bring that up in the count when people are searching because there's multiple homes for people to search for. So those are the strategies that we use to try to get your home sold is as many outlets as possible. You're paying us to do a job. So you're paying me to do the advertising, not just stick it on the MLS and hope for the best. Even when we were in a hot market, we continued to do the video. You know, uh, again, we're paying a different photographer than we are a videographer, two totally different things along with the website, uh, with the website writer that has one three, four banana street or banana Avenue with a little QR code. We, we go all out no matter what the market's like. So yeah, sometimes we also will highlight in the home, um, a nearby amenities where we'll talk about what type of restaurants are nearby. So whoever's walking through, they can get a feel for the neighborhood if they haven't been there before. A lot of times we have people flying in from, um, other places, or maybe they are relocating from another, uh, town in Oregon, but it's just, they haven't gone to that neighborhood or that area. So. Um, try to give them a feel of the neighborhood to make it a little bit more um, determining if that's an area they want to be in. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, homes are homes. Neighborhoods are what people really want to move to. So you have to highlight and show them the neighborhood, too. 
And that's what we really try to stress and point out in most of our videos. At least half of the video, I believe, uh, I've never timed it exactly, but at least half of the video is videos of the schools, uh, the local shopping areas, and if any highlights that are in there, that's what we give our videographer is a list of things that we want highlighted around there, along with on the printout for the uh, uh, flyers that are sitting out front of your home. There's a list of the amenities on a little bit. Okay, question number four. How long will it take to sell my home? Sellers want to understand the typical time it takes to sell a home in their area and factors that could impact the selling timeline. Three hours. That's all it takes, right? Three hours. You wait a day. How come I don't have an offer? I don't. It's it's crazy. A lot of people, it, 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 there's a lot of things that determine whether your house is going to sell fast or sell slow. So again, when I produce a CMA, I'm going to give you the months of inventory on the market. So in that mile radius, if we've got in a three month time frame, two houses that have sold, six that are active and two that are pending, that's kind of telling me that we have about a three month worth of inventory. So two are selling a month, right? So we give you those stats. So you can, if you want to be the one to sell, you need to do everything that you can possible to prep it and make it look better than everybody else. Uh, in this day and age, people are looking for everything to be done. So we want to make sure as much as possible is done when they're paying the high interest rates. They don't have the money left over uh, to be doing a lot of the work that may be needed afterwards. So pricing it correctly. Again, it all depends on your timeline. Uh, we also have, like I mentioned earlier, 40% of the homes have had price reduction. So pricing it right from the start will usually get you a higher, if not at asking offer on the home if it's not overpriced. So listen to your realtor for sure and they'll tell you. Uh, effective marketing is going to also have an effect on how your house is sold. Again, if you're just throwing it on the MLS, uh, yes, it goes to all the other sites. People are looking at all the other sites and how attractive is that house to anybody who's looking at it. Uh, so what are the pictures like? You know, how are they being presented? Most people have a very short attention span I've seen houses, and I'm not cutting any other realtors down. Please don't, you know, post anything below about this. But uh, when I have five pictures of the front of the house to start with, by then I've lost interest. You know, one to two pictures of the front. The first one always has to be the front of the house by our MLS rules. After that, let's show them the inside and the highlights. Make the best pictures first, or do it in an order as of if you're walking through the house. Uh, is a good way to do it to, again, pique their interest. But if there's only three areas, the primary and the kitchen and the backyard that really sell it, make those up front, put everything else towards the back. But uh, good marketing. And then preparation. Uh, like I was saying before, if you if you prep your home and have it as neutral as possible and as complete as possible for the majority of the buyers that are out there, that's going to help you sell your home faster. So there's no set time frame. You know, we can do our best guess based on, like I said earlier, what's the current market of inventory that's in that area. Um, but there's three things that do it, uh, 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 that, that affect the home selling fast. That's what I call my PLC, price, location, and condition. So we can always adjust the price later on. You can never change the location, but you can change the condition. So there's two controllers that you have over location. Again, if you're amongst, if you're the most expensive home, in the cheapest neighborhood, it may take longer because not a lot of people may want to live around. So it's, again, each one is going to have its unique uh, issues and selling it fast. Again, I, I'd have to say the best thing to do is price it right from the start. Listen to your realtor, price it right from the start, and it'll sell faster. If you've got six months before you plan on moving, the market can change so much in six months that the value that you put on right now may not even be close to the value later on. And now you're just starting those price reductions. Every price reduction that uh, an agent sees, they're probably going to take and knock a little bit more off of it, thinking that now you're desperate because you've been on price reduction. So those are the things. There's no right answer for that. Uh, again, each one's going to be different. Some get multiple offers the first day. Some get multiple offers three weeks later. So what is everybody doing this weekend? Is it a hot weekend for... Uh, uh, high school graduations or, or birthdays or whatever. So holiday. holiday week. Yeah. A lot of things, a lot of factors. So no, no set answer. One of your favorite questions. Answer. You're like, let me just look at my magic eight ball and tell you the exact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I do have one of those too. If you yeah. want some, if you want me to answer that way, I'll pull out my magic eight ball. This is no good. Yeah. It always comes up. I'm not sure. 
Okay, so question number five. Should I make any upgrades or renovations before selling? Sellers may ask for recommendations on which upgrades or renovations will provide the best return on investment and help their home sell faster. Uh, that's a good question. And again, each home is going to be unique to this answer. So some of the most common things that I suggest that people do, uh, I, again, you've personalized it for yourself. Um, so the most major thing I may ask you to do is changing out the carpeting. So you have pets or kids and I come into the house and the first thing that I smell is pets. That's going to turn off the majority of the buyers, even if they have pets. They just, that's your smell, not their smell. So people are really sensitive to that. Like I said earlier, first 30 seconds inside the home, what do they see, smell, and hear? Do they hear traffic noise? Do they smell pets? Do they smell fish? Do they do anything? A lot of that is permeates into the walls over time. So it's going to take some airing out to get rid of it or changing of the carpet. But a lot of times you can just do minor things. The decluttering is a big thing. The changing all the light bulbs to the white or the daylight, uh, not the white, daylight light bulbs, uh, painting, you know, again, sometimes again, we, we, we have all these pictures and everything all over the walls. We suddenly take them off and because the way the sun comes in, it is faded, the paint around the pictures and you have dark spots, paint the whole thing. Patching of paint doesn't always make it up. Uh, today's current, yeah. uh, popular color is back to the basic white. I mean, we've gone out of the grays, industrial grays and gotten into the whites. I'm not saying that you need it. We just want to make sure that we decorate around that. Uh, but there's a lot of minor things that you can do. Take those little uh, Mr. Clean type sponges and go around on all the doors and all the uh, trim boards because that's been kicked or or uh, uh, brushed up against by your furniture, whatever it may be. So you want to take off all those scuff marks, make it look like it's freshly painted there too, along with the caulking and uh, stuff like that. Minor repairs and maintenance. You kind of know already what they are. So if you were going to have, you know, your, your uh, potential new boss for a higher paying job coming over one night with his wife, how would you want the house to look? And that's what you kind of have to think. Like I said, the cosmetic updates, the kitchens and bathrooms, again, these need to be clean. This is where people do their cooking. They do their personal, you know, hygiene, whatever. They need to be as clean clean as possible. I always suggest changing out all toilet seats if there's any kind of staining on any of them. Uh, fresh towels every day, uh, especially in the guest bathroom where people may be using it. The kitchen decluttered, you know, ha leave as much counter space as possible open, just leaving those few items that you may use on a daily basis. But we want to declutter those. Um, the curb appeal, I said earlier, is going to be a big thing. Again, this, this is probably one of the biggest things. Because if I drive up and the grass hasn't been mowed for a while or the bushes are all overgrown or there's cobwebs around the light, that's just setting my tone. And it could be subconsciously about how the rest of the home is going to appear to me. The rest could be awesome and maybe you can get them to get over that, but sometimes you can't. Well, many times you can't. You've already set that mode or that mood as they walk in by not having that perfect curb appeal. And then uh, market conditions uh, uh, also do that. I've never asked anybody to take and do a whole remodel of a kitchen. Now, if you have a uh, beautiful home, everything's been remodeled except the kitchen, or it's halfway through its remodel, then let's finish it. You know, that's going to get, not every not every remodel is going to get you 100% return. Uh, and the, what's going to get you more than 100% return is those minor things that I told you about uh, back in the deck. Uh, if you have boards that are rotting, you want to replace them and then restain the entire thing just so it looks new or looks the same or similar to, um, again, the weeding and feeding and things like that, just in making it look as picture perfect as possible. Uh, yeah, move in, move in ready. Because again, that's what, that's what people are wanting nowadays is that move in ready because they can't afford to do, or they don't want to see, oh my gosh, look at all the work I have to do. The wife may be in love with it or the husband may be in love with the house. But the one who's going to be doing all the little handyman work may not be in love with it. And they're going to be saying, oh, list honeydews here. No way. I don't want it. I don't like it. They'll fit, figure something out there. So, um, again, that is kind of an open-ended question. Uh, but a lot of times it's just the minor stuff that will take care of things. Something that can be done with hopefully within a couple of weeks. 
And best bet is to have them out to your house so you can see yeah. things visibly, give them recommendations, maybe prioritize the list, and then they can determine what's their sense of urgency to get things done to get the mark get it, the house on the market. That could probably help you too to divide and conquer which ones are most important. Yeah. And and again, your realtor, don't don't take it personal from your realtor if they tell you to do certain things. Um, because they're just trying to tell you what's going to get your house sold. So never, never take that thing personally. Sometimes if it's somebody who's uh, a little bit too close to me or who I think may not want to listen to me, that's when I'll bring in the stage and let her be the next guy. Yeah. Her or him. So. Got to neutralize the home. Yeah. So question number six. What are the costs involved in selling my home? Sellers seek clarification on the various expenses associated with selling their home, such as realtor commissions, staging costs, closing costs, and potential repair expenses. Yep. And, and that's a good question. And that's going to vary on most homes too. So some of the basic charges and, and it, those are variable too and negotiable, but the agent commissions, I mean, you can go for sale by owner and not give any agent commissions, which is going to restrict, well, potentially restrict people wanting to look at your house. But yeah, you want to pay an agent a commission because they're the ones who are investing all the money and the time and getting your house advertised just so it can get sold and guiding you through the whole process. So agent commissions can vary. There's no nothing set. You know, I've seen uh, some of the lower um, um, listing types. So we're talking just the listing side as one percent, a half percent. Some people charge a thousand dollars just to put it on the MLS. So a full uh, service realtor like myself. It's going to be depending on if we stage it or not, location, how long do I think it's going to be on the market, and the value of the home. You know, if it's really high value, I may reduce a little bit, uh, but it's usually got to be over $4 million before I do that. Uh, anything else is going to be a standard. And again, I have to see your home, to make sure. Uh, closing costs are going to be the title company's closing costs. So as a seller, you don't have to pay anything except for the title insurance for the buyer. Okay. Um, it's this required by law in both states that I'm licensed in that you have to pay for title insurance, or at least a buyer has to get title insurance from someone. Uh, they may offer to pay it on themselves, but they're also paying for title insurance for the lender if they have a lender. So title insurance and then the title and escrow fees, you know, I, those as a seller can be right around I'm guessing here, nothing set in stone, 1% or less for a total of that. Uh, repairs and improvements, those are things that you need to do anyways that you're going to get a lot of the money back on. So that's some of your costs is what are you putting in to get it repaired um, and prep for it. Now, you may be hiring out to do some of this. If you're in a hurry. Probably best to hire out to do it versus trying to take your weekends and your evenings uh, doing that. You may love doing it. That's great. Um, I, I I do the same thing when I'm ready to prep my home for sale, but I'm this way. Hello, moving help me. So um, uh, that's going to be a cost to you. Staging, again, I, I can offer to you as a listing agent, I'm going to offer to you either a higher commission rate because I'm paying for the staging up front, but never sells, I've lost that money, or I'm, I'm offering to, for you to pay for it. Okay, so if I recommend staging, if it's an empty house, it needs to be staged pretty much until the time it sells. So we can offer that to you. And again, it's going to be at a higher uh, percentage rate that I charge for it, but staging helps give people a view of what their home could look like. So that could be a cost to you. You're moving costs, of course. You're moving somewhere. So are you doing it all on your own? Or are you renting a truck? Or are you renting movers? So you've got those costs that you have to consider too. I have no idea because you could be moving across the street. You could be moving across the country. You could be going out of country. Uh, it all depends on how much you have to move. So that's going to be another cost. Uh, home inspections and appraisals. Now this is on the seller side. So they don't have to do a home inspection or appraisal. It is smart to do a home inspection prior to listing, but then everything that you find out from that you would have to disclose. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying if you want a pre-listing inspection done, uh, anywhere from 400 to six to $800, depending on you know the size of the home, location, what type of inspections they're going to do, you wanna know what's wrong with the home first so you can get everything fixed in advance so there's nothing that will uh, Keep the, yeah, no surprises to you and keep the home from selling. Now, every inspector is going to come up with different reports. And you can also market it as pre inspected. And then, w with a pre inspection, if you share that inspection with a potential buyer, they may waive their inspection. Mm -hmm. I would never recommend it to my buyers, but they may waive it just because it's a competitive market. So, having that pre inspection done, right, again, right around $800. 
utilities and maintenance. Of course, you're going to have to pay for the utilities and the maintenance of all the appliances and everything else that's still in the home. Pre-listing it too, I highly suggest because everybody's going to ask whether you get your HVAC service. Get it done now, cleaned in service, just to make sure it's operating fine. And most people don't. And you just want to have that uh, last inspection results put on the front of the HVAC. So when they see it, they can see it's been cleaned and serviced. Uh, capital gains tax is going to be another cost to you potentially. So again, everybody's got a different situation. I am not a tax consultant. Don't want to be. Uh, everybody is different. I, I, there's defaults of you know five hundred thousand dollars in capital gain. If you're a married couple, two hundred fifty thousand as an individual. Again, that is not an answer for me. You go to your tax consultant and see what they have to say because again, everybody's situation is different. And you lived in it two out of the last five years. There's a lot of a lot of factors in there for that. So. To answer your question in short, <laughs> it's going to cost anywhere from, you know, uh, again, uh, for if you're listening in with me, five to seven percent. It all depends on what costs you want to incur in advance, like the inspections and, and things like that, items like that, uh, staging, and of course, your title fees. There's certain fees that you can get out of. So, for question number seven, how do we handle multiple offers? In competitive markets, sellers want guidance on how to evaluate and negotiate multiple offers to maximize their sale price and terms and ultimately determine what's the best offer, which we know sometimes isn't always the highest price. It's not. I know it's weird, right? Oh. Um, but there's certain things that might um, be worth it for a you know seller to take that offer over a higher paying one. And how do they navigate that? Know what truly is a good value versus you know, just take the highest price and call it a day. Yeah. I had a lot of people want to do that. We're all, we're all inclined to go for the higher price. And, you know, who's offering the most? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to look at that, you know, uh, a, a lot closer than the other offers. Uh, are, are they waiving inspections? Are they waiving appraisals? Are they willing to come up with a difference on the appraisal compared to the sales price? When we had a lot of that a few years ago, uh, I never recommend waiving any of those things myself, my buyers. But um, people have done that. Uh, uh, so, so the highest offer doesn't make it the best. Uh, a lot of people who are going for, let's just say it's a $500,000 home, and there's a lot of competition. You get 10 offers, somebody's willing to go up to 650000 But are they doing it with 3.5% down, 5% down, 10% down? Are they waiving inspections? Are they pre approved? When these are things that your realtor uh, should be checking on. We're going to be calling up the lenders, making sure that they are pre-approved and how far along they are in the process of getting pre-approved. Is it just that they filled out something online or have they got uh, Again, cash offers, fast close, waiving things, higher offers are good. But a lot of times I look at it too and I educate my clients. It's, it's up to the seller on which one he wants to take, but I have to educate it. We, we as realtors have to educate them on the differences between all of them. You could have all of them, uh, four of them that are very similar. So you may want to go for the one that may have the uh, higher down payment, you know, especially if it's a, let's just say again, $500,000 home and they're offering 575. You might be a little bit concerned uh, with the appraisal. So if they've got a higher down payment uh, on there, the, sometimes those appraisals are waived. But again, you want to talk to, we want to talk to each lender just to make sure that the pre approval is truly a pre approval and it's a valid lender. And possibly not somebody who's, you know, just uh, mass producing these loans online. Uh, but again, no offense against any of them there. But if I can talk to a lender who's local, who's going to answer my question, knows our contract, you know, Oregon contracts, somebody on the East Coast may have experienced a few of them. But if they're doing every state, they don't realize and look at every state's contract. Because there's time frames, frames in there that are going to affect and can affect your earnest money deposit. So, uh, again, looking at those, you've got the little love letters too, you know, yeah. sometimes those may help. Sometimes those may not help. Definitely run them by your realtor first, just to make sure that there is no uh, discriminatory, uh, verbiage in there or, uh, anything like that. And then, um, you can go back to all of them. So again, let's say you have multiple offers, you can state to all the potential buyers there. You have five offers, three offers. I don't care what it is. Hey. Mr. Buyer's agent, we have three offers. I'm going to be reviewing them at such and such a time. Give us your highest and best. So you can verbally counter to each one that way. 
and then review all of them, see if there's any modifications that have been made on the offer. And then you can also, if you have time, if they're not all limiting you on time, or if you have time, you can counter offer what may look to be the best, but there's one little thing in there that you don't like. You don't like the 20 day inspection period versus a 10 or a seven. You may want to counter them with that. or maybe it's a great offer, but they're putting down low earnest money. You can counter them for the higher earnest money. Uh, that is some of the things that you can do in a counter prior to accepting or negotiating which one exactly that you want to work with. Uh, you can also, with the multiple offers, you can look at them and contact, let's say out of 10, you look at three that are the highest, contact each one and say, we haven't made up our mind yet, but if we didn't choose yours, would you like to be in backup position? So get a feeling for that uh, also, just in case you don't want to lose all of them. Because when you get that many, just remember you're having to reject nine people who have, you know, potentially fall out of love with your home. I always hate the multiple offers because again, you're having to say no to nine people. Um, and they're doing the same, you're doing the same thing to them to start with. So all of a sudden that first highest offer backs out or asks for, you know, again, say they went from 500 to 575 and then they asked for $45,000 in repairs that aren't really necessary. And they say, well, we're going to back out because, you know, we want this. Maybe they just wrote that big offer just to get it for that. So you want backup offers uh, in place or potentially in place because the more the time passes, the more chances they are finding another home. Um, then uh, like I said, consider the buyer's qualifications. How long have they been around? How long have they had a job? That's, you know, between you and the lender and, or not you and the lender, the listing agent, me as your agent, the lender and the other agent, uh, other agents reputations make a big uh, deal on this too. Uh, you know, if, if you worked with difficult agents in the past and they're the ones that are offering, you, you want to share that information with your seller. You're not, you're not cutting down the agent, but you want to say, I've worked with this person in the past and on multiple occasions, this is what's happened just to let you know in advance. So it's very important for us as agents to keep a good reputation out there. And then consultation, uh, you know, again, you can consult with me, consult with your spouse, you can consult with your attorney, you know, for taxes and that type of purpose, but uh, always consult with whoever it is that needs to make the final decision on this. Um, just remember though, the more people you get involved, the uh, you know, I come from a family of seven kids and you're never going to get the seven of us to agree on anything. So the more people get involved, the less likely that'll happen. But all of them have a time frame on them. So just to answer the best one that, that you feel good about in that timely manner. Uh, factors. I mean, I never thought about backup offers before I started working in this industry. And it's just such a logical thing to do. As, and to know that it's an option is even better. So and how to negotiate that, that's what they're for, for realtors. A lot of times, I, I don't know the quite the statistics on it, but I want to say from experience, multiple offers where you have a backup offer, maybe 75% of them go through, 25% of them fail. I've heard higher statistics. So it doesn't hurt to be in a backup offer position. Just don't be in love. Don't stop looking. Yeah. Continue to look if you're a buyer. Um, but as a seller's uh, agent, you want to make sure that, you know, you have some potential backup offer or two that will be willing to stand by. And of course, if the first one fails and there's no backup offers, your realtor should be calling all the other offerers to see if they found anything yet to see if there's still an interest. That's going to affect the price though, too, because again, remember they've been rejected once. Yeah, we don't like being rejected. None of us like being rejected. So. All right. So for the next question, question number eight. What disclosures do I need to provide to potential buyers? Sellers inquire about the required disclosures for their state or local area, including known defects, property history, and environmental hazards. So, yeah, the best thing to do is disclose, disclose, disclose. Every state, every area is going to have different laws on what you need to disclose or the uh, property disclosure statement. So the two states that I work in, Oregon and Washington, is required by law that you fill out the property disclosure statement. We're not allowed to help you answer the questions. We can try to tell you what it is they are asking. For example, I have a lot of people saying, what is this first right of refusal? You know, they don't know what that is. So I can help them say, okay, that's it. You have somebody, Aunt Mary, who wants to buy the house in case it goes on the market or your children. They want to have the opportunity to compete against the highest offer. Uh, that'd be like first right of refusal. They have that um, set, usually entitled. Uh, not always so. It could be an agreement that you guys have on the side. Uh, but you have to fill out the property disclosure statement. As I tell my buyers, 
this is the most important document in the entire process because if you can prove that somebody has lied on them, then they can come back at you. Then you want to be as honest as possible. With that said, when I say as honest as possible, meaning if it's asking you, is there insulation in the floor and you've never been in the crawl space, I don't want you to answer yes because that's what you thought was there. Yeah. It's better to probably answer a don't know or go and look before you answer that question. Yeah. But don't answer a question if you're unsure of it. Um, you know, don't and don't answer it as yes or no if you're unsure. If you're unsure, if you're questioning it yourself and you want to say, but again, there's things that you can do to answer it truthfully, yeah. you know, but so you, not everything should be a don't know, don't know, don't know. That's going to look suspicious, uh, even in the court, if somebody brought you to court for it. So again, if you've done anything to the home in these disclosures, if you've done any remodeling, you're going to have to pr have license, uh, license, uh, uh, excuse me, permits by licensed, uh, contractors who have done that work, you know, if it required a permit, if you've done just some of your own remodeling, change that toilet or moved a sink, as long as you haven't moved the plumbing fixtures himself, that's completely fine. So long as you haven't changed anything from two to a three, uh, as far as fixtures inside of a bathroom, say you make a, a half bath, a full bath, that's going to require a permit. If you didn't do it. If you did it on your own, different story. Yeah. Because now you're not being taxed on it too. Uh, that could affect it, but you want to disclose anything and everything as much as you know about the house. Now that is not to say that you knew in 1920, when this house was built, it couldn't have had this done, but you're guessing there. So you're not there to be responsible for a prior home modification that somebody may have made. This is for what you know and what you have done with the home since you've owned it. So disclose, disclose, disclose. Uh, Lead-based paint, anything prior to 1978 has the possibility of having lead-based paint done. You can have a lead-based paint test done. Most people will just get the pamphlet and say they don't know and they've never done any testing. All you have to do is just say honestly. If you've done testing, you're going to have to uh, reply to that. Uh, the same thing with the uh, natural hazard disclosure. If you know the house down the street has fallen off uh, you know, the edge of the cliff here or here, you, if you've been warned by any kind of city or geological survey or anything like that about hazardous materials or fill that's underneath your house, then you want to disclose that. You, you don't want to hide anything again because all you're doing is giving them information for them to do further investigation and further inspection based on what it is that you're telling them. Okay, so it's not a negative to disclose, but you want to disclose everything. You don't want to hide that you've done work in the crawl space and then, you know, an inspector misses something and then all of a sudden the call space is crumbling down and they have previous records. You know, you as a buyer have previous records that they left the call space work that they did right. and you didn't get those until closing. Now you can go after the seller because they didn't disclose that they had this work done. I mean, again, you want to make sure that you disclose anything and everything that you know about the house. Uh, HOA information, they're in a special assessment if you're in a condo or an HOA association are there any special assessments disclose 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 title issues uh there could be title issues you want to disclose those to the title company to your spouse uh to anybody like that you may may know that there may be some unpaid um a child support something like that of the title company just so they're not going to be you know uh surprised and shocked or you go to the closing table and they say oh you owe this in child support and come to find out your wife didn't know you had child support so disclose, 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 get rid of those. Pest and termite issues, if you have had pests in the past, get somebody back down in the crawl space, get you know uh, one of the pest control companies, come back out there, make sure that everything looks good. Bees you know, tend to get into certain areas that if you see a bunch of bees hovering around one of your open vents, more than likely they've invaded the inside of your house uh, in, the, in between the walls or up in the attic space or down in the crawl space. Uh, 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 um, other rats and things like that and dig holes. They don't have to go through a screen vent. They dig holes to get into your crawl space. Now all of a sudden you've got all your insulation torn apart and rat poop and stuff like that. Rat feces, excuse me, I should say the right word. Um, uh, rat stuff down there that you don't want. So if you know of any pests and termites that you've had in the past and you've treated, been treating for them, disclose that. Legal issues, disclosing legal issues that you may know about the property. 
and environmental issues if you bought the house, you know, many, many years ago and you had it converted from an oil tank to natural gas, disclose that there was an oil tank. If you had a septic tank and you went on to public sewer, was either of those tanks, the septic and or oil tank, decommissioned properly? Is there DEQ certificates? Um, or is it still sitting in the yard somewhere? Disclose where it's at, that there is one there. Let the buyer can investigate and do what he wants, but you're just wanting to disclose it. everything and anything that you know about it. Later on, if they pull up and they see that you're the one who put in natural gas and that used to have an oil tank and now it's out there leaking and you didn't disclose anything about it, you said no or unknown, and yet you did that and you knew it and they can come back at you for that. So disclose, disclose, disclose. Question number nine. What happens after we accept an offer? Sellers may have questions about the next steps in the selling process, including scheduling inspections, appraisals, and preparing for closing. Oh, you mean the buyers just don't come in with a bag full of cash and say, hey, let's do it? Uh, so the first thing that happens once you get an accepted offer is you're going to be opening up escrow. Both sides are going to be opening up escrow. We'll send all the documents, the, uh, the uh, final mutually accepted agreement for the title company to open up escrow. Or within a certain time frame that's within each contract is when they have to deposit the earnest money. Now remember, earnest money is refundable if they back out for a contingent reason. It's refundable to you if they back out for a non-contingent reason, but it's still going to take both parties to really set to whoever's asking for it. Uh, both parties need to sign off on it. So the first thing you do is open up escrow. Then the uh, buyer's agent and the buyer are going to set up inspections, you know, and that's in within a time frame that's been set in the contract. Please make sure you read that. It's business days or calendar days or whatever. All, all uh, inspections, unless renegotiated for extensions, have to be done by a certain time frame and the negotiation for any kind of repairs or credit for repairs, uh, if there is any, by that time frame. So let's just say in the state of Oregon, you have 10 business days to do it, uh, starting on a Monday and it's the first full business day. So we accepted the offer on a Sunday. They have two Fridays to finish it by 5 p.m. and negotiate any repairs or credit for repairs or back out. So then you have that 10-day inspection period at the same time uh, they may have the inspection done on day five and they still have five days to negotiate the repairs. So just because they did the inspection doesn't mean that inspection is contingency is satisfied. It still happens until that last date and negotiate repairs and remove, automatically remove that inspection contingency. At the same time, the lender should be ordering the appraisal. So that's up to the lender. It's not up to the realtors to order the appraisal. They're just putting it up there in the cloud because now they're no longer allowed to talk directly to the appraisers. So somebody from the cloud grabs it out and says, I'll have it done this day. So you're going to get an appraisal done day 12. That's just them coming to visit it. They're still going to take two, three, four, five, six days, depending on how busy the appraiser is, to get that final appraisal over to the lender. And you as a seller will never know except that it, it appraised that value uh, or there's condition. In other words, the appraiser came out and said, yeah, we're not going to uh, uh, appraise this at that because you don't have a stove that operates, or you don't have a heating system that operates, or they found something wrong in the crawl space or attic space, depending on the appraisal and the appraiser. So those are the conditions that'll be put on the appraisal that you'll have to fix. Otherwise they can back out under the uh, appraisal and finance. Uh, then the loan approval too still takes time up until let's say it's a month or 45 day close. Uh, it could take any period of time there somebody could lose their job. So the loan approval process goes all the way up until the end. Um, they may be stupid enough to buy a car the day before close and all of a sudden their, their uh, uh, credit score has changed and now they can't afford the house. So hopefully then you can talk car dealership into taking the car back. All right. Uh, contingency removals, again, they're going to be removing the contingencies. Either they're going to be removed by default, you know, 10 day inspection, 5 p.m. That's, you know, it's kind of been defaulted out of there. Or they've had the inspection and they write an inspection removal, contingency removal, appraisal contingency removal. Again, a lot of these are set on um, by, be done by a certain time frame. So they automatically expire at that point in time if nothing has been asked or said uh, about it. Uh, title search and insurance. So as soon as we open up escrow, the title company is going to be doing a title search. So they're going to be sending you a preliminary title report. That's for you to review for anything uh, you want to be, especially looking at the liens. That's where you're going to see the liens of of things that you may not know of, uh, that you forgot about. Oh, I forgot I borrowed $10,000 or I forgot I didn't pay this contractor or something like that. Those will be liens against your property that will be taken out of the proceeds if you don't pay them beforehand. 
you're also going to see your final loan amount, not your final loan amount, but the loan amount that you originated on it. And there again, the title company is going to make sure all that's paid off. They're going to take care of all liens prior to giving you any proceeds. So that's in the preliminary title report, uh, along with any HOAs, covenants, codes, and restrictions, that type of thing. And that's more for the buyer to look at. Uh, you probably looked at it when you bought the place. Uh, then expect them to do, uh, and again, title insurance. You have to make sure that it's insurable. Uh, they may ex expect to do a final walkthrough of the property, and that's usually two or three days before closing. could be the day of closing. You know, that's expected. It's not always written into contracts, but it's kind of common courtesy. So you want to make sure that you keep your home in the condition it was when it was shown all the way up until the time you move out because that's what they purchased. And under the contract, yeah, I believe it's the same as what they seen it as. Uh, and then, of course, when all that's said and done and the title company finally says, okay, we're set to go, we're going to record by 5, uh, 5 p.m. on this date, it's time for you to move out. So those are some of the major uh, timelines in there to expect in that. Again, the uh, opening up of escrow, preliminary title report review, inspections, repairs, negotiation, loan appraisals, contingency removals, all those things are, you know, all at different and a lot of them have a different, a specific time of day that they need to be completed up um, in. So that's another wonderful thing that your realtor will flag for you is the date and time that things are needed. So that's pretty great. You don't always have to be as working at all the calendar. Yeah. And again, remember your realtor should be watching a lot of these time frames for you just to make sure that the contingencies are met. Yeah. Last question. Here we go. Question number 10. What if my home doesn't sell? Sellers want to understand their options if their home doesn't sell within the expected time frame, including adjusting the price, relisting it, or exploring other selling strategies. So that's a good question. So if your home doesn't sell within the time frame that you had or we had agreed that it should sell on it, there's several options that you consider. And the first one is, of course, is reevaluate the price. Uh, again, we're going off of just because my CMA said that your home's value, and you should be looking at CMA too. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to hype it up and say, oh, it's worth more than these other ones that have sold recently because, again, I want it to appraise too. Um, so the last thing you want is high offer and not appraising and then it coming down because you've already spent the money in your head. So you want to reevaluate the price and just say, okay, it's been on the market three months, five months, six months, whatever, and you haven't adjusted the price. What have the other homes sold for in that time frame uh, for you so you can adjust that price down? So that's one of the things you want to do. Uh, you can update some of the marketing strategies or some of the old pictures, you know, uh, the first picture. Remember that first search that you did when you looked for homes. You probably seen 20 possible homes and you picked out the top 10. You know, subconsciously, we'll rule those other 10 out next time we see them because we don't know why we ruled them out. It could be because it didn't have a uh, hair condition. It could have been this, that, or the other thing. But if I see it again, I'm saying, oh, I've already said no to that one. I've already said no to that one. So you want to change up the pictures, get some new marketing materials, out there, get some new advertising, figure out who's moving into the neighborhood. Why are the other houses selling? Figure out why these other houses have, have sold prior to yours and is it price, is it condition, is the location, is it the neighbor? Sometimes we may even have to offer to mow the neighbor's yard. Let's say, just say you have yeah. a couple neighbors around you that don't ever mow their yard. You may want to offer as your landscapers coming up to yours, say, Hey, for the next three months until it sells or next month until it sells, can I have your lawn mowed? Yeah. You get their approval, you know, you can pay for it. You don't want to just mow it, but you may have to help out selling your house with that little bit of an investment. Uh, improving the home presentation. Again, it could have been a vacant home. You didn't want to pay for staging. You didn't want to uh, pay me the extra for staging. Now that it's sitting there, again, a lot of people, they just can't, they, they don't have the imagination. Of, I mean, they do, don't get me wrong. I'm not cutting anybody down. But if, if I can't see how things could be laid out in a house, yeah. I'm less likely to buy. Just like any ad that you put out there, just like any dating site that you go to, the first thing that you're looking at on the ad is what does the product look like? Whether it be, you know, a dating site, or what does the product look like? You know, or a magazine where they're trying to sell you whatever it is. What does that product look like? They, they do thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars with a study make a look the most appealing to what people are looking at for today. So again, we want to make sure it's staged properly if you haven't staged it in the past. Um, so that's improving the home's presentation. The offer incentives, uh, if you don't want to really go out down on the price, because again, all the other homes are doing this, 
uh, offer some incentives, offer to pay for closing costs for the buyers. You know, any buyer's closing costs, you can go from, you know, anywhere from a monetary amount to a percentage of the sales price, offer to pay for those. Uh, definitely analyze the feedback that you're getting. So your realtor and any open houses should be giving you feedback as how, as the house is being shown. We're out there requesting from the listing or from the buyer's agent or from the buyer to through the buyer's agent for feedback. What did you like about the home? What did you not like about the home? Everybody has the same common feedback. Oh, they didn't like the neighborhood. Again, can you do anything about the neighborhood? Likely not. You can't do anything about the location. You can't do something about the price and the condition. So again, what are you willing to invest in in the neighborhood uh, to make it look more appealing? But look at that timing, sometimes the market conditions. Let's just say we had a big crash or something happened with the market. Um, uh, interest rates shot up a half a point. I mean, that's going to affect it. Uh, we're, we're out of the days, sort of, of a house selling within a week's time. If I, I mean, even realtors are still freaking out. It's been on the market all the week. It hasn't sold yet. What's wrong? But then week three, week four is finally getting the offers in and again, sometimes multiple offers. So give it a little, a little bit of patience. We're in a higher interest rate. We're in a still uh, low inventory and a lot of buyers out there, but they're being very picky about it. So you want to make sure that you have that uh, set. Uh, change the listing status. You know, sometimes you may want to uh, withdraw it while you do some work and then bring it back active, or you may want to uh, talk to your realtor. I know the MLSs aren't going to like me for this, but generate a new number for it. That number does not take away the total days on market, but it does generate a new number. If you look at any MLS number in the Portland RMLS, right now a 24 will tell you it was listed in 2024. 23 says it was listed in 2023, and so on and so forth. So if you're getting in from one year to the next, you may want to get a new MLS number and that can be done with a price change too. You know, maybe don't just do it. Just think that's going to be the the cure all for it. But with a price change or after you get it staged, then gener generate a new MLS. I did that and finally got a household. Uh, and then open communications between you and your realtor, uh, realtor to realtor, uh, realtor to anybody. Is uh, we want to make sure that we're giving you the feedback. We want to give you our opinion. And remember, uh, our opinion is based on our knowledge, which is usually a little bit more. Uh, than what most the average person has, because again, we're working with buyers and we're working with sellers, so we know what they want. So uh, listen to your realtors, listen to the feedback. Don't ever take anything personally. You know, please don't take it personally. You want to get your home sold, so let's do what it takes to get your home sold. So rest assured, I'm committed to getting your house sold, but I'm also going to be honest with you from the start. And again, I'm none of it's ever personal. It's just this is what I do. I'm trying to tell you, this is what it's going to take to get your home sold. So I will do my best. I will market it all I can to get it sold. If it's way overpriced, you're probably not going to see me investing a lot of money into it. Um, I may take the listing, but if you're not listening to me, I'm not, it, it, it doesn't, I don't care how much advertising money I put into it. An overpriced home is not going to sell. So. Yep. There it is. Yep. All really helpful information. Um, if you guys have any additional questions or something sparked a question from the responses or questions that we were asking, definitely comment below. Um, like Tim said, we want to like, subscribe so you can get more helpful information about the um, real estate industry or our market specifically in the Portland, Southwest Washington area. Um, and continue to check out what we've got going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's more than 10 questions. These are just 10 of the most common questions answered. And uh, we definitely don't want to make this a six hour long video. But definitely, uh, you know, comment below if you have a question or feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Tim at pdxreteam.com or uh, in Mariah's an unlicensed assistant. She can't help you out very much there. But Tim at pdxreteam.com or give me a call or uh, like me on Facebook, send me a private message on Instagram at PDXREGuy. Uh, that's Instagram at PDXREGuy. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can for you. If you send them to me, I'll be sending the questions to him. So go to, talk to, to the source. So uh, again, thank you for listening today. And uh, we hope to hear from you again soon. All right.